everyone to this afternoon's webinar. You hopefully have all just consented uh, to, to, to the recording session. <clears throat> it's great to have so many of you on the call. Um, I don't know about you, but it's been, it's been a long week uh, in, in Mersey Care. I'm sure it has for you. So uh, um, I, I hope that this is a, 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 a positive and forward looking experience for people to go into the weekend on. Um, we are going to try uh, our, our best to keep to time here today and also to ensure that everybody gets a chance to ask the questions that they want to ask. We will, of course, also make sure that some uh, Q&As and written responses to some of the questions are made available to you with the recordings afterwards. But uh, let's, let's, let's get uh, moving this afternoon in terms of this uh, exciting opportunity. We think it's an exciting opportunity uh, in this partnership between Liverpool City Council, Mersey Cares Life Rooms, and hopefully um, uh, some of the attendees here today and the organisations they represent. Um, my name is Michael Crilly. I'm the Director of Social Inclusion and Participation uh, for Mersey Care and have accountability for the Life Rooms. Um, I'll be kicking off with our slides um, at the beginning of the session, but I'm also joined by three other colleagues who will be speaking today. Uh, Jane Cook, I think she might be able to give us a wave. Jane is from the public health team at Liverpool City Council. So uh, Jane will be here talking today about the rationale and motivation for this partnership. Uh, my colleague in Mercy Cares Life Rooms, Jane Holland, uh, up at the top of my screen. Um, and Jane is head of business and innovation at the Life Room Service. And then also my other colleague from Mersey Care, Amy McMeekin, who is the Life Room Service Lead for all of um, our uh, Life Rooms activity across Liverpool. Thanks, Amy. Um, could we perhaps get the slides up, please, Martin? Very much. Okay, folks. Um, the, essentially, we can move through to the second slide, actually, Martin. I think that's just the, 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 the cover sheet. Um, the aim of today's session, and I do promise we will keep you to time and get you, get you done by three o'clock, but the aim is to provide information uh, of, about a, a number of key issues that relate to this initiative. So to give some of you some background information around the life rooms, because we know not everybody will know who or what the life rooms is and does. Um, information around our public health pilot project, and also um, the, the uh, commission funding that we have available today that, 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 that's brought you here all in the first place. Mm. Talk about the priority areas and focus for the funding that we have, the criteria and eligibility to apply for the funding, and um, really importantly, the outcomes and the legacy we're hoping to uh, achieve through partnership working in the coming year or so. Um, and then most importantly of all, uh, the opportunity for you as attendees to submit questions about um, any of the funding opportunities that you hear about uh, today. So next slide, please, Martin. Um, just in, in terms of what does the Life Rooms offer, uh, some of you I know are already partners working alongside the Life Rooms in a number of ways. Um, it is a service that is operated by Mersey Care NHS Trust. Um, it's a non-clinical service, entirely non-clinical. Um, and and, and the, the, the slide you see in front of you is effectively the co-produced statement that we have uh, around our, our, our vision, purpose and mission, really. This comes uh, very much from the reality. This, this service was developed by Mersey Care um, uh, purely out of the lived experience of people accessing Mersey Care service users, Mersey Care services. Uh, and, and effectively, we thought, it's important for you to see that this is the purpose behind uh, why Life Rooms comes uh, into being, and that it is very much about the communities that we're all here to work alongside and serve here in Liverpool. Next slide, please, Martin. In terms of what Mersey Cares Life Rooms is actually about, we've tried to give you a bit of a visual representation here. So, so the Life Rooms model that we operate, first of all, in uh, Walton, the old Walton Library on Rice Lane in the north of the city, was set up just over five years ago. And its overarching purpose is to improve population health. That's, that's the name of the game. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to do it in a truly preventative way through social means. And it's very much about enabling people uh, and activating them around their own health. And we seek to achieve all of that uh, through three particular, we call them pillars, the bottom rung of that, that rainbow, three particular modes of working that we're engaged in. The first being learning for well-being, 
the range of learning opportunities delivered either by staff of the life rooms or a large number of voluntary and community sector partners and, and there's a number of you who have been involved in our learning activity on the call today. The second one is the one that's uh, more, more and more talked about over the last few years and has become more and more of a reality uh, across Liverpool, it's social prescribing, that ability to connect individual citizens, members of the to the community assets that exist uh, across the city. And then the third pillar is community, um, which I suppose from our perspective manifests in two ways. You know, we number, operate a number of physical hubs through which we deliver services. So wherever we land with our hubs, we seek to be responsive to the communities in which we are situated. We try to respond um, and, and co-produce the type of offer that we have from within those hubs with the various communities that exist around us. But I guess the other main feature of that community pillar is, uh, is to go beyond and try to reach out to communities uh, who very often suffer from inequalities that lead to poorer health outcomes. So those are our three pillars, the three street work streams that everything anchors into. Um, and I guess the, 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 the one thing I'd really like to talk about that I think we haven't yet been able to to make a reality, but want to make more of a reality in partnership with the City Council and people on the call today, is that section where it talks about system change. Uh, the fact that actually we are all in our various different sectors of this system, working for the same people, the same communities. We're all acutely aware that there is more than enough work and need out there. Um, and I think what we're trying to suggest to you today, and you know this already, and many of you are already working in partnership with one another and various statutory organisations across the city, is that actually we will more effectively serve those communities and meet those diverse needs by working together. Thanks, Martin. Next slide. Um, just uh, the, this slide and the next one give you a little bit of a flavour of the kind of activity that we have had in the life room. So until the pandemic hit us almost two years ago, which is horrifying to think of, um, we had you know, a huge amount of physical activity through the doors of our various different life rooms hubs. And we'd start to uh, expand our, our peripatetic outreach uh, to further parts of the city. Um, obviously, when the pandemic hit, uh, a massive amount of uh, our, our, our service provision had to change. So what you see there is the 12 months leading up to the pandemic. Uh, which shows a huge amount of great work but I guess one of the things that's really um, we've become proud of is the work that's shown on the next slide which is actually uh, a sheer amount of activity that um, had uh, was actually achieved during the pandemic. There are so many of you around this call today who were doing incredible work who on the turn of a 10 pence piece had to actually completely um, alter the way you delivered your services to get to people um, in new creative and imaginative ways and and it was the same for us we had to radically transform how we delivered our service but I guess as we've come through that pandemic uh, the knowledge is is that there is now a massive massive need already there was a massive need around mental health uh, there was a massive need around a greater increase of preventative opportunities for people to access, but it's been exacerbated phenomenally as a result of the pandemic. Next slide, please, Martin. And this is where we find ourselves today. And, and just before I hand over to, to my colleague, Jane Cook, mm -hmm. I guess, you know, we are going to continue to change and develop uh, because of, we, of our need to respond to the communities we serve. Uh, particularly in the reality of moving beyond COVID. And this is very much about recovery from COVID. I know given the current state of play, it sometimes feels difficult to think that we are moving beyond it. But this project is very much about how we begin to build back fairer and better um, uh, as, as we move beyond the pandemic. And at the forefront will be that focus on system change that I mentioned when you saw our, our pretty green rainbow earlier on to ensure that communities more readily can access the support that they need. Um, and the public health work streams moving out of COVID are focusing very heavily on the prevention offer that I know actually is the thing that drives many of you the desire to get beyond statutory formal services where people actually present to the hidden hurt and harm to do a truly preventative piece of work that delivers a better outcome for the individual, but of course also has a massive impact 
on how services can be delivered. So that's that's more or less a sort of a, a brief uh, setting of the scene. As Bernadette said in the chat, you are going to get all of these slides um, sent out to you as well. But at this moment, I'd like to hand over to Jane Cook from Public Health to talk to you a little bit about the origins of the funding that we're here to discuss today. Jane. Thank you, Michael. Um, do we need to move on to the next slide? OK, um, so, yes, yeah, so just to say a little bit about the um, where this came from. Um, Liverpool City Council, like most authorities across the country, received what's called contain outbreak management funding um, to impact to be used to influence outcomes that had been adversely impacted by the pandemic. Uh, and when we set out to understand where the greatest impact had been, it was immediately very clear that outcomes related to mental health and well-being and also to risk and suicide in the population were the most significantly impacted. And what we did know about a lot of the poor mental health and distress that had been created across the population as a result of the conditions of the pandemic was that the majority of it falls below the threshold for specialist mental health services. And our evidence base indicated that what was needed was community orientated solutions to help people to tap into things that improve their mental health and well-being, and also to address things that yeah, present that risk to their mental health and well-being. So that led us towards uh, our focus on prevention and community-based model uh, building resilience. Um, there are, um, so there was somewhere in the region, upwards of 20 million pounds that arrived as part of uh, contain outbreak management funding. And uh, I personally am involved in somewhere in between 12 and 15 programs, and this is one of them. Um, so just and, and my colleagues across the department have been working um, with a uh, with a, an even broader network than that in terms of um, the impact of uh, in terms of uh, working together on different programs to impact those outcomes. Um, there are some limitations to that funding. Um, it is fixed term funding, um, but with that, there is an expectation that we do. Uh, we go to the greatest extent possible in being able to demonstrate that we are creating sustainable change in the system uh, and you will see that reflected across the criteria um, uh, and all of the documentation surrounding this grant process um, so I think is is there anything else that you think I need to add to that Michael or does that is that I don't I don't want to go on too long about the the background to conf um, is there anything more that you think I need to add? No, I, I, I think that's fine, Jane. I think right. just so people know where the fund, funding is coming from and that it's, yeah. it is, it's, it's, it's one-off funding, I think, is important yeah. for us as well. Yeah, that's right, yeah. And next slide. And I guess, this, Jane, it might just be helpful because the, these give some insight into the eight yeah. extremes of the pilot project. Yeah, absolutely fine. I'm sorry, I, ca I can't see the presentation in front of me <laughs> other than what's on the screen, Nicole, of you, so I couldn't recall what was coming next. So, yeah, so um, so leading on from what I said, so, yeah, they, it's fixed term funding, but there is an expectation that... Um, where possible sustainable change is created in the system and as I said um, it's about influencing outcomes that we know have been adversely adverse particularly adversely impacted by the conditions of the pandemic so those are the those are the things around the resource itself and um, as we worked through that process that I described earlier um, of in terms of taking that funding and that model uh, it, according to an evidence-based approach to impacting the most important outcomes and the ones that had been impacted the greatest, we identified a number of core outcomes that uh, sit across the whole um, of, of the um, the whole of the comp investment scheme. So you will see this list of eight things um, reflected uh, across almost everything that's to do um, with comp. Um, so these are these are some of our these are some of our core themes essentially that are replicated. Uh, you'll see them here represented in this in this uh, grant process that we're here to talk about today. But you would equally see them uh, replicated across. Um, uh, all of the other um, conf investment work streams. Um, I'm not going to read them out because you can all sort of see them in front of you. Um, is next slide as well. Next I think slide as well. You. 
There we go. Yes. Yeah, so there, there are, as I said, there are, I think there are probably fair to say there are technically more than seven work programs, but we have been working specifically uh, with the, with the life rooms around um, a range of different things and they are summarized here. So we have been um, looking at um, identifying that families with, uh, with young children um, had experienced a very specific set of circumstances that led to their uh, a particular uh, a significant impact on emotional health and well-being in a in in an ongoing way and um, we have um, placed some emphasis on being able to develop the skills of services that already support families with children preschool age children uh, and um, to help them to have the skills to be able to ensure a stronger impact uh, around well-being, mental health and suicide prevention within that work that they're already doing. Um, and then we have the um, we have our sort of extension to community based model for prevention that the life rooms operate. And work well, like like with everything in COM, um, we are looking to um, test and develop and to look at new ways of working. And the reason you will see an emphasis on evaluation um, throughout uh, throughout this presentation and throughout this program is that all of the, it's important to mention that all of these programs, um, the evaluation that comes out of them will very much be brought together to uh, develop recommendations to inform um, what are the priorities for the future um, what strategically need to be priorities for Liverpool and therefore what do we need to think in terms of uh, commissioning decisions for example for the future and um, so um, so evaluation is really strong within all of this and I know we'll come back to that later uh, and then the third element here um, is the, the one that we're here to talk about here today a, a voluntary and community sector grant program to be able to build capacity because what we're acknowledging in here is what what comes with build uh, opening doors to people uh into you know the first two the first two essentially engage people in a conversation about their well-being get them get them you know face to face with someone who has enhanced skills um, to talk to someone about well-being, about what the determinants and protective and risk factors are around well-being, and very much to support them and guide them to take options to improve their situation. And what comes with that is the need to ensure that the system ready, the system is ready as it, as, as ready as it can be to be able to accept them and work with them on those things, whatever it might be. Um, so the grant. Uh, the grant program that we're here today is very much about that element. It's about being able to do what we can to ensure that the kind of options we really want to we really want to channel people in there are are there and are available to them, uh, and to, to strengthen what exists across the sector. Um, so yeah, so for as it as it says um, here uh, across a twelve month period, um, the life rooms bit will be developed will be delivered across community sites uh, in Liverpool um, uh, in order to uh, and in partnership with you all and the work that we'll generate here today to be able to positively impact uh, on the health and well-being of Liverpool residents uh, according to an evidence-based and prevention focused model. Thanks very Have much Jane. Okay yeah. I think you've done I think you're done I think it's over to okay. you now Jane Holland to talk about the nature of the uh, commission that we're here to discuss today. Thank you. Just have the next, thank you. Thanks. So, uh, yes, going to talk about the process really of this uh, pro commissioning program, um, which, as Jane has very eloquently explained, is here to improve the health and well being of, of Liverpool residents. Um, and we want to use this pot of money to commission some opportunities and activities through the voluntary and community sector organisations. And as uh, Michael has said, many people, if not everyone, at some point has been um, impacted by the pandemic. But it's become clear that there are certain groups of people who are more impacted than others. And so we've looked at what we believe are our five priority areas um, in which we would like organisations to work with us. Um, to help 
these um, areas of people and to look at the uh, money in the pots. So the five priority areas you can see there are the parental mental health and well-being and resilience of families and young children, socially isolated people, and particularly um, improving relationships between older adults and other vulnerable groups, employability, because there's been a lot of implications around people's jobs through the pandemic, physical activity, um, and that's to enhance people's mental health. You know, lots of people have taken up um, walking and other kinds of activities to help improve mental health during lockdowns. Um, and we want to build upon that. And the marginalized groups, the refugee and asylum seekers in particular. And of course, um, they have not only been impacted on by the pandemic, but also the situation in Afghanistan that um, developed last year. Next slide, please, Martin. So the funding available is £700,000. Um, and as we've previously said, the Life Rooms is going to micro commission services for this 12 month period. The funding will be made in the form of a direct award. And that grant will be in a one or overall amount at the start of the project. And it's anticipated that the funding parameters will be in a range of between 50,000 and 100,000 per project. And we're expecting to commission around 14 projects not fixed to that, but that's just a, a, an example of what we're expecting to come out of this. Next slide, Marty, please. Sound like um, Professor, what's his name, Witty on, um, on all, of the, uh, all of the comms updates. Um, so those are the things that we're keen to see from these um, applications and from the projects, particularly around pre pre preventative aspects and integrated approaches, and to see um, projects that look at people in the context of who they are individually, the context of their families and their communities and neighborhoods. So really holistic um, projects, and not as problems to be solved, but we want people to be seen as assets that we can invest in. So these are some of the criteria around um, the bids that we will expect to see. So we want um, the applications to demonstrate sustainability beyond the funding period. We want the project funding um, to be used not to set up new organizations or to fund additional staff, but it can be used to strengthen or extend existing projects. All project submissions should have a robust exit strategy and must demonstrate a willingness to work with appropriate and smaller grassroots organizations and address one or more of the five priority areas that I mentioned in the previous slide. Okay, next slide, please. So we're looking in a essentially at mid to large sized organizations. And this is the criteria that they must um, follow in order to submit proposals. Need to have been established for at least 12 months as of September 2021 demonstrate an income of 750,000 as per last accounts, demonstrate that 75% plus of the existing beneficiaries or beneficiaries of the proposed project are residing permanently or temporarily in Liverpool, and be a, a non-profit organisation with a constitution or governing document and clear charitable objectives. 
Okay, next slide, please. Who can apply? Community interest companies, but they must have at least three directors. Have an organization bank account with two or more signatories, be able to produce annual accounts for the past 12 months. Provide an up-to-date safeguarding policy and be able to mobilize activity no later than the 1st of April, 2022. And the next slide. So the timeline, the all important timeline, organizations will be invited to submit an EOI by the 31st of January. Successful organizations from that stage um, will be notified the week beginning the 7th of February. Full submission deadline will be the 21st of February and expected commencement of all activity no later than the 1st of April. There'll be contract monitoring meetings held on a quarterly basis and the awarded organisations we will expect to submit a final evaluation report in March or early April 2023. Next slide please. That's a repeat of one of the slides that I've already talked to. So that's just outlining the priority areas again. So next slide, please. So the monitoring and evaluation, as we've said, all organizations will be expected to provide quarterly performance monitoring data um, and an overview of the data collection methods for you to consider are outlined in the commissioning path. I'm sure that um, people will have their own outcome measures, et cetera, that they work to, but we just decided that we would provide some examples in that commissioning um, pack for you. Life rooms will be working with you to explore current and new data collection methods uh, so that we can agree a data collection framework. And the following guidance should be considered as part of designing and implementing your data collection activity. And I'll just go through what that might mean um, very simply, but we can um, we can talk about that offline or you know later later on. But side by side, that's really collaborating with your users of the service as part of the data collection. So everything that you collect, everything that you offer up as the evaluation evidence um, should be demonstrate meaningful outcomes to the service users, the people who are using the service. Demonstrating impact, um, again, significant focus on evidence impact on the service users, on the staff, on the communities, on the neighborhoods, et cetera. Partnership. Partnership would be evidence of collaboration with the smaller grassroots BCS organizations um, as part of the service delivery. And we mentioned that earlier, and that should be included in any of the reports. Sustainability speaks for itself really, but the creation of sustainable working practices. Evidence of spend, Obviously, evidence of spend details against the budget application should be included in the monitoring and evaluation reports. And the governance, all data collection plans need to be agreed by the life rooms and adhere to the organizational governance arrangements. As I say, we can provide a little bit more um, information on that outside this webinar. Next slide, please. So um, in order to evaluate the impact for uh, participants, we might ask you to implement a standardized questionnaire for all participants. This will mean that the life rooms can um, conduct a service evaluation of the impact of the funding programs. And we'll explore the practicalities with you in the early stages of the contract. We'll meet with each of the awarded organizations to discuss all of the arrangements and any support um, and help that you might need. 
Next slide, please. So a recap of that all important timeline. Expression of interest by the 31st. Successful organizations from that stage notified by the week beginning the 7th of February. Full submission by the 21st of February. Contract monitoring meetings held on a quarterly basis. Awarded organizations submitting a final evaluation report in late March, early April. And probably one of the most significant ones, mobilization of activity to take place no later than the 1st of April, 2022. Next slide, please. And I'm going to hand over to Jane and Michael to talk to this last slide. Sorry, couldn't find the unmute <laughs> much, Jane. Um, and I guess really um, this is fairly self-explanatory, but it is that um, intent on the part of both our commissioner and us as, as a, a micro commissioner um, to, to focus on building capacity and assets beyond the funded period. You know, we're looking for a legacy to this, I suppose, and uh, sustained impact for individuals. Um, so we are really, you know, one of the things that the panel will be looking at in any of the submissions is, is the sense of how project activity might be sustained beyond that initial uh, pilot period during which there is pump, pump, pump prime funding available. I don't know whether Jane would want to add anything to that as well. Um, am I on? I'm off mute. Yeah, great. Okay. Yeah, I, I think it's, um, it's obviously... Um, it's a tricky one and it is it's often a challenge isn't it with um, short term funding that this can be the expectation you're asking for sustainable change with fixed term funding um and it, it is a really challenging one so i guess all i wanted to offer um was just um to let everybody know that some of the ways that that has been achieved across the work has been for example by developing workforces uh, you know, training, enhancing skills, that kind of thing. Um, but what's been really important is training in itself can be, uh, and building skills in itself can be an unsustainable uh, change, as I'm, as I'm sure you all well appreciate, because if you have a cohort of staff that have their skills develop and then over time workforce is obviously evolving change and you can start to lose that from the organisation. So, I think where I've been really excited about, about what I would consider to have been good examples or really the strongest possible examples of sustainability and sustainability in that way is where uh, organizations and partners in other programs have said, okay, well, we are going to use some of the resources going to be around developing skills and training workforces, but we as an organization, we will take on, we will ensure there's a trainer the trainer element to that and we will take on the ongoing development of those skills and the supervision of that within the workforce and we'll make it part of our business and um, so I think that's that's kind of one example that just helps I think just to help to demonstrate what we mean by sustainable impact with it with a fixed term fund and um, another example has been where um, sort of specialists have been brought in not to be caseload holding individuals uh, as in with you know with, with with individual members of the public that they support because I think the last thing that any of us would want to do would be to create a cliff edge at the end of the funded period where there are a whole cohort of individuals that have felt supported and then that is suddenly whisked away because the funding ends but but specialists have been brought in for example to support organizations that want to work to better in part work better together in partnership or that want to work according to um, a national model of delivery or that want to work more consistently and co coherently together to have greater impact Impact on outcomes by working together in that more enhanced and skillful way um, and again you know the partnerships that are being built there have acknowledged that they they will take that on as business to maintain um, that consistent and collaborative working after the funding ends so that's all, all I wanted to add really I'm, I know that across everybody in the room there will be much more vibrant and creative ideas than that going on but I just wanted to try and describe a couple of examples of where that concept of sustainability with fixed term funding has been done really well if that's all right. Jane. 
And I think that leads us through, I'm hoping, to the last slide for the Q&A. Is that right? It certainly is. I just wonder, is it easier to take the slides down or at this, Martin, so that people can, can see one another a little bit better? And we've got 20 minutes to go for questions. Welcome to a number of my colleagues um, who are here to assist with some of the questions you may have. Uh, us from financial and uh, contracting backgrounds as well to help give uh, an answer. But does anybody have anything they'd like to um, uh, ask of the panel while we're all in here? Hello, Simon. Hi, sorry, I'm not Simon. <laughs> you think you were, but <laughs> my colleagues do my account. Um, yeah, just a, a question. So, I'm from Mary Seacole House and. Um, in the presentation, you said that the annual income has to be over 750, and um, obviously that does eliminate a lot of smaller charities. So, would you consider a joint bid? So, say for example, if three small charities got together, a combined annual income, or does it not quite work like that? So, so, so on this one, what we would consider a consortium bid, but there would need to be one of the partners who did meet that threshold. And I appreciate that is that is something number of organizations we we have considered this um, I, I think it's important to note that the the comp funding has um given rise to two particular um grant award schemes towards the voluntary sector so one that you may have seen that was run by the lcbs towards the end of last year and, and in consulting you can't, in consulting the lcbs there was the sense that the one that they would operate would be from those from ten thousand to 750 but then there was a clear desire that we should try and spread some of this activity and creativity uh, more broadly across the sector so this one is aimed at the 750 and above however there is a very clear expectation um on on, on our part that there would be um, and that actually uh, medium to larger organisations would be demonstrating those authentic partnerships and the necessary support to those partnerships to deliver on what the idea may be, the proposal may be. Um, sorry, can I just add, ask as well, is, would that be part of your monitoring process for, for, the, for the project, whether these larger organisations have actually engaged with the smaller ones? Is that We're looking for that clear demonstration yeah. Of, of that engagement, yes. Amazing. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you. Anybody, uh, Wynn, you've got your hand up. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, hi, Wynn Lawler from Irish Community Care. Um, we're obviously one of the smaller organisations. Um, my question, though, is around um, you said that there are to be no new posts created within this funding. Um, obviously, part of what's happened over COVID is that, um, and, and previously in, in the few years before COVID, there's been a massive reduction in third sector funding. Um, so my question really is, how do you guarantee that the work that's going to be done in this is not just going to be the same old, same old? that has excluded the communities that aren't in part, a part of it already. And although you're talking about monitoring the small organisations being engaged in partnerships, how are you also going to ensure that they're not the same old, same old too? Because for us at Irish Community Care, that, that's a big consideration. It, you know, funding's cut, the com it's become really competitive. We know that staffing of, you know, staff have gone, there's whole programs that have disappeared. Mm. How do you make sure that this is going to be innovative, that it is going to be different and it's going to be actually inclusive of the communities who have been part of this before? Uh, thanks, Wynne. and I think you make a good point that's that's clearly very much reflected and endorsed by many of your colleagues on the on, on the call. I think the rationale around that requirement on staffing is is so as not to almost exacerbate some of what you've highlighted, the sense that actually um, it could be used to, to keep the lights on a little bit longer. I think we're very, very mindful that it would be disingenuous for us to suggest that this is money that um, at this point would continue beyond the 12 month period. You know, it is very much COVID recovery related funding. Um, what I guess we are looking for in, in, in our stipulations around some of uh, the evaluation here is actually that creation of an evidence base that begins to stop the same old, same old, 
where we're desperately trying to keep the lights on after a 12 month period and in a frenzy of activity as it comes to to to, to, to the end of a, a particular contract so it's not uh, i suppose um, the full answer you would want from that, but I think what we're trying to do is not to um, be false in, in, in expectations that there will be further funding. We want to work with you to get good evaluation, to build an evidence base that uh, potentially leads to future activity. Uh, but we're, we're trying to be cautious and realistic in that. And I think, I, I mean, what we are very, very mindful of this, this particular process is a bit of a new process in terms of partnership between the council and the NHS is that is in itself a desire to ensure that it's not the same old same old stuff coming through mm. kind of can't afford to do that anymore it's about the creativity both in partnership working and in use of money to actually you know reduced funding as you've identified to mm. make new things happen at the, at, at the best possible point I don't know whether anybody yeah. else I mean, whether you would want to come in at Could, all can, or can, Jane can, that can, when did you want to come back on that? Uh, sorry, yeah, just, just on that, I think that's a really good point, Michael. I think that you talked about um, kind of like uh, the monitoring. I think though what we need to do is look at what that's actually going to say, because that's that, if the devil's in the detail in, in, yeah. in that effect, isn't it? Um, for example, looking at public health, um, you know, the inclusion exclusion data that we have around um, communities of which are a lot of the smaller communities, you know, homelessness and um, people from asylum seeking refugee, gypsy traveler communities that aren't actually mentioned in this group, but are part of public health, England's inclusion exclusion groups. And um, so, and the, the Marmot report stuff, um, you know, that should all be feeding into this. Um, and I'm just wondering how that's going to be evidenced and what are the outcomes and what are the um, the requirements for reporting around those areas, because they will make a difference. For example, you know, usually what happens, Michael, is, you know, is, you know, you put somebody puts this out and then it's kind of like people get into groups and go, yeah, this is great consortia idea. Let's do this. But actually, it's the smaller groups with the excluded communities who are chasing around trying to find somebody to pal up with in order to. And it's us with the least resources, least energy, most you know, excluded community members who are doing all the work in these processes. So if, if you put the outcomes in and they're very clear from the outset, people already know who it is that they need to be having those conversations with. And that means looking at MARMA and the excluded in, the in, exclusion inclusion through public health, um, just to say that really. Yeah, and I don't think there's anything in there that we would disagree with either. And I think also, I think for us, some of this is about us not being uh, so prescriptive that we hamstring this because as you are rightly saying, you know your communities better than we do. So it is about how we work together in partnership to ensure that those outcomes are the right outcomes we're seeking to achieve. Thank you. I think Helen was next in line on my screen for a question. Helen Hi, yeah. Um, so my question is, um, there's no new activity to be funded, but, um, well, um, but um, would you be interested in funding new partnerships? Um, and um, if the activity that was being, so um, basically we're a smaller organisation, but we already have a partnership lined up with, a, with an organisation that meets the criteria of over 750. Um, and um but we um the activity would mostly be delivered with a community organization um and the activity would be like building on activity being developed being delivered in the community with the partnership with a kind of bigger organization offering development and kind of um uh, data support kind of thing um and then being the kind of uh, applying party if you like but the the work being done by um, done by us would that would that be something that was within the criteria i I'm, I'm looking to 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 jane and bernadette my instinct is that it would is that actually what we're looking for here is is the ability to have a a lead partner that we would deal with who meets that threshold uh, i think actually my own view is um if there were such a, a larger organization having that sense of responsibility and willingness to provide sustainability and cross-sector working in the city. Um, that's something we would really be interested to see to see happen because that's what will give sustainability and vibrancy 
to the sector moving forward in increasingly challenging times. Uh, would, 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 would colleagues agree with that? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Well I guess that we, um, we are looking for an organisation to um, do business with, if you like, so um, the governance around that, and we would deal with that organisation. And then if the work was being done, as you've described, through another organisation, then that would be absolutely fine. Just a quick follow-on question to that. Um, is there any kind of mechanism for connecting smaller organisations to bigger organisations? Because I'm aware, I'm listening to what colleagues are saying, I'm aware that um, we have a partnership lined up, but it's possible that we might be able to involve some of those smaller organisations in that partnership. Um, and is there any way to connect, to connect up those who might be interested? I think that's a really good point. I mean, I, it, 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 some of the, some of the issues around this relate to the timeframes involved in doing this. I suppose in terms of the logistics, certainly, um, the, the you know within the life rooms we have a number of pre-existing partners already. Uh, now it may be that you know if somebody has an idea that they want to put forward, we could connect with the partner. I think what we can't do is get involved in any of the um, actual bidding processes or or demonstrate a partiality in that. Um, so, so I, I, I guess we would deal with approaches as they came, but I am conscious that we have uh, quite a short turnaround on this one that might not allow for a more detailed mechanism of connection. And I guess just to, to, um, to add to that, we've, we've been on, on, on the other side of that, if you like, so I do really understand how difficult that is in a, a tight time frame. Um, I've got sort of lesson learn, lessons learned from that has always been we must grow these partnerships before any of the bids or the tenders come out. But of course, life takes over and you don't get a chance to do that nice piece of work. So, um, yeah, I, I, I do sympathise with the tight time frame. Thanks, Jane. Now, Michelle, you had your hand up and come down. Is that OK? That's fine. You're, you're comfortable. In that case, I think you would. Yeah, I, I just wanted to do the same as Helen and ask. Hi. Hey, we little. <laughs> Anyone want to play with us? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. You and I think you were next, and then Mark. Yeah, I think a lot of people would maybe have looked at this and said, your year's funding actually should go to developing partnerships and trying these innovative things. One of the good things about having small organisations involved is they're very light on their feet and they can adapt. And you can find these uh, interesting and innovative models. But I think you've sort of pushed by going for this higher threshold, you've kind of pushed that the other way. The, the other thing uh, is that uh, in one of the slides, it said that you, you're asking for, in, for community interest companies. I'm assuming that that means charities, CICs, other sort of models other than the community interest thing. Um, but yeah, I would, I, I think. Um, you need to be looking at to get truly innovative stuff in a short period you've just got to say we'll have these smaller organizations doing things because otherwise you've you've kind of pushed it back again and defeated one of the objects of this funding thanks you and again i know it's a perfectly uh, valid valid point that you make absolutely um i think you know part of this is as we say is a, a desire on the part of our commissioners to right the way across the sector and hence the LCVS opportunity where, which were ring fenced for smaller organizations. I guess this is an attempt to try and see how, how larger organizations can potentially uh, begin to work more collaboratively to ensure that they are more grassroots. And I guess we're learning with this one. So, so there may very well need to be um, a follow-up approach to this, but I do take your point. Um, Mark, you were next, I think. Yeah, hi everyone. I'm um, I'm from Age Concern Liverpool. And I just had a question with regards to to the funding of existing projects. Would you consider funds being used for a service that has recently ceased uh, or just come to an end? And in addition to that, would you be open to the funds being used for for staff who have recently been made redundant? I think that's probably no, Jane. I'm looking to you for for a fuller answer, but I think in terms of of how we're stipulating if it's about staff, it's about staff. Oh, Sorry, you're on mute, Jane. I'm on mute. I'm coming up, I'm coming off. I've got the wrong mute button. <laughs> yes, yes, that, that's absolutely my understanding of it, Mark. 
Right, okay. So even if it was something that had come to an end in the last month, that wouldn't be. I think I think we're still saying it's it's come to an end. <laughs> yeah. I think the reality is it has come to an end, and I think that's what's in the documentation. We would have to stick with that at this point. Okay, thank you. Claire, Claire Marnie, you were next on my list. From mute, I I'm think. Off. Uh, yeah, speaking off mute. Um, is it all right if I ask two questions? Yeah, go for it. I'm conscious we've only got five minutes, but yeah. <laughs> so uh, they're both quite practical questions. One is, um, if small community organisations can find uh, a partner organisation that meets the 750k threshold, could that, could that organisation put in two bids with different community organisations? Assuming, I mean, there aren't very, the, the, I mean, I guess there aren't that many bigger organisations where the relationships are established enough, but, you know, noting Ewan's point about it takes time to build up you know, people know to need to know each other before they get into a business deal, basically, don't they? I mean, that, that's perfectly understandable in any kind of walk of life. Um, but um, if organisations um, have got, if there is a, a, a large organisation that w is willing to, to kind of host a couple of bids, is it possible that they submit two or three even? I don't think that that is problematic. I think what we would say within that is that we would be looking for a good distribution of bids against the different priority areas. So if it was the same organisations around one priority area, we are looking to see something. Yeah, sure, sure. But in principle, so I they, don't think that's... It would have problem. to be two very distinct bids. I think I think you would be looking. We would we would be reluctant to be uh, uh, doing doing the same thing twice if you like. We're looking for some diversity in the, across the priority areas. Yes, absolutely. And my second question really relates to um, the monitoring process. And if you could say a little bit more about what you will be monitoring. And I suppose this is coming from a place, uh, I mean, people will know that I work at the CCG. Um, often when we're, we're when we get to the point where we issue contracts, obviously, we, we tend to be reviewing against a specification. It takes time to develop the specification, the outcomes. So it's really what's important is what happens before, before a competition is run or the development goes into the, the beginning bit. And then there's a kind of soft bit at the beginning when the service is establishing itself and you'd expect things not to quite turn out as envisaged. So, um, so I think the first 12 months is often a period where Things don't go according to plan or, you know, a better way of doing things presents itself once you get into it. So I wondered what kind of flexibility. I mean, you, you, you've talked about welcoming creativity. So I'm, I'm kind of wondering what your monitoring process will look like to ensure that creative ideas can be um, explored during the first, well, at least during the first six to, to nine months that, so that you don't, you know, you don't lose that kind of poss the possibility of expl exploring things. Thanks, oh, I'm think, Jane, to respond to that. So I think not being um, prescri uh, prescriptive at all around what we're going to be monitoring, we've taken the view that people who are putting in the bids will know their service and their service users and the communities they serve much better than we will. And so may have their own ideas and their own um, ways of monitoring and the things that they monitor. So what we want to do is to have a very early meeting with each of the award winners, if you like, and have that discussion with them. Can I just add a little bit to that, if that's OK? Um, just to say that um, I'm sort of linking back to a point that we made earlier about evaluation here. Um, and it's just to say that one of the things we are really interested in is it being able to evaluate not only individual programs that come out of this and out of Conf more broadly, and but also to bring that evaluation together at a kind of collective level to really be able to dem demonstrate what the total impact has been on outcomes that are consistent, probably going to be consistent across a lot of the work. And I think things like well-being and mental health are probably good, you know, feature across everything here. Um, so one of the things that we can offer to do is advise around the types of measures 
uh, that are being used and that we you know that it would be really helpful for Liverpool to that meta level analysis if we all can we're able to kind of use some of the same types of tools that are comparable so that we can sort of contrast and compare and bring together some of the findings um, and that will be really important for the future in terms of understanding what all of this work tells us about what works best for Liverpool um, but as Jane has said, that's not really about being too prescriptive about how projects are monitored and evaluated. It's more about how can we work together here as a partnership uh, in terms of generating uh, intelligence about health and well-being in Liverpool and how it is best improved. Thank you, Jane. Thank you very much. Have we got any last questions? Thank you very much. The, 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 it, it, it's been really, re, really good to have everybody here and I, I'm very grateful for the participation, both those of you who have spoken and also in the chat. Um, Bernadette, I think I'm right in saying that we have a full contact list for everybody who is on the call and we can distribute that together with the follow up information. Is that correct? We can indeed. Thanks for everyone who agreed to share the info. We'll do that afterwards as well as um, uh, just a reminder of the emails to ourselves and, and, and uh, contracts as well. We've got the lovely Lynn Kelly with us from Mercy Care Contracts who can provide further insight. And then we'll follow up this with a recording of the webinar because you can see everyone furiously scribbling and copies of the slides. Um, likely be Monday for the um, more technical stuff like the um, recording of the webinar and stuff, but I think the priority is the contact list for yourselves. And we'll also include a little link to uh, an evaluation about the webinar as well. That's okay. Really appreciate it if anyone can feedback. Thanks. And my thanks to Bernadette and everybody who's been involved in putting the webinar uh, together as well today. And thank you all for taking part. Uh, we hope that you will be uh, putting some submissions in and we really look forward to seeing those expressions of interest. Thank you for giving us your time today and have a wonderful weekend when it comes. Take care, folks. Bye bye now. Bye. Thank you.